David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everyone. How you doing? It is Monday, November 22nd, 2021. Just keeping the date straight here. Okay, time for another show. It's Thanksgiving week, as a matter of fact, and so time for us to declare out loud that we don't exactly know what we're doing for Thanksgiving week. But I did, in fact, work this out earlier ahead of time with Greg Dworkin. So we're going to go ahead with the first half of the week schedule as normal and do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday at the very least. And Thursday, well, I know a lot of you'll be stuck at home and maybe cooking the turkey and might want some company, et cetera, et cetera. But I guess we'll probably at this point, well, by Wednesday, we'll already have a house full of guests. So uh, fair warning for Wednesday's show that it could at least maybe say in the 10 o'clock hour become, uh, well, Less a radio studio and, and more and more a gathering place, and uh, might be might be a little noisy in the background. Got to decide how we're going to handle Thursday and Friday. It would be nice to take that time off, but it would be nice to hang out with you too. So I don't know. We'll see how much cooking needs to be done and how much of that needs my hand and all of that. And uh, usually a good fair number of things and last minute tasks and uh, errands, etc. Probably the same for you too. You probably won't be sitting around listening to the radio. Uh, all right. We'll see what we can prepare for you, but uh, and seeing what the week brings. In the meantime, of course, we have figured out what the weekend has brought. Greg has put together his usual raft of stories, raft O stories, as we like to say. I see some 31 entries in the Skype chat since I checked in last, so that should keep us well stocked and ready for a while and, and probably has a story or two that could carry over into shows for the last half of the week if that's what we can manage in between trips to the store and uh, frantic rounds of cleaning, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so, you know, it's uh, pretty much the same here in our place that it is in yours, unless you are traveling, in which case you are manic over that. Instead, uh, lots to round up over the weekend, of course. Oh, yeah, there was a travel-related story over the weekend, too. I noticed this one um, actually brought to my attention as it was breaking by Twitter pal and friend of the show, Judy Vincent, who sent me the story that a lot of you then picked up on and shared. It was really interesting. Ah, yes, right. Mighty OCD, noting that we'll have a full production staff on hand for later in the week. That's probably true. All sorts of producers you never even knew we kept back here. Uh, The story that Judy Vincent sent me that many of you may have noticed, travel-related, Thanksgiving travel rush-related, that down in the Atlanta airport, they had a gun fail incident, and not just the regular routine gun fail incident at the airport of finding somebody who claims that they have forgotten that they had a gun in their bag at all, but a gun that actually accidentally discharged, as some people like to put it, as some people hate to use the word accidental discharge, uh, the phrase, uh, when talking about these things. I don't know. I still haven't settled on it. But at any rate, um, backgrounder on this is weird and and stupid and difficult to understand exactly how it went down from the details that were offered. But uh, the CNN story on it, a passenger's weapon accidentally discharged at the Atlanta airport causing panic and halting flights apparently involved uh, this guy being pulled aside for some secondary screening. And I guess at that point they had not yet discovered the gun. I guess I go to tertiary screening once they discover, oh, he actually has a gun. And they were, I guess, opening up the bag and searching the bag because I guess they must have seen it on the x-ray or whatever. But uh, at some point he lunges for the for the bag and grabs for the gun, I guess, because he realizes he's in trouble. And I don't know whether he's seized with panic. Probably, I mean, the, probably the best explanation for it is the guy realizes it's in there, and if he, he, you know, he thinks the wrong thing. If he just goes and gets it and says, "Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I forgot that I had the gun in here," but don't worry, I'm gonna, you know, give it to my son who dropped us off at the airport. I don't know what he's gonna do exactly. Maybe he has some plan. Maybe not. Maybe he just feels like if he takes it out and shows them, <laughs> that he'll somehow be in less trouble. But actually, at that point, 
Of course, reaching for the gun, probably a terrible idea. And in fact, it was. I don't even know exactly what motivated him. But in addition to all of this, I imagine the nerves also cause him to accidentally fire this thing as well, which is really crazy. And of course, everybody hits the ground. People are running. They are uh, you know, flying out the doors and, uh, and, and panicking. And they're announcing that there's uh, some sort of issue and they send everybody out. They evacuate the airport, the whole thing. And over the weekend, I saw people tweeting about it, that they were actually there at the airport and asking questions, you know, so it was an accident. Does that mean we can come back in? I'm going to miss my flight, et cetera. The people are outside the airport waiting for them to, to give the all clear. And I don't know, it was a great incident in terms of waking people up to the number that you and I all know from following the gun fail series in particular, when we publish them over at daily coast of how many people show up at the airports these days with guns and how for the past decade or so, They've been breaking the records year every year, every year, year over year over year, every year after year after year uh, of guns discovered by TSA agents at airports around the country. And people were agog, I guess, at finding out that they were up at, uh, oh, about 4,600 guns found so far this year with the travel rush yet to come, well in position to top. 5,000 guns and almost every single one of the people caught with the guns will say, I forgot that I even had it with me, which raises hackles properly across the country. And uh, I don't know. So you tell me breaking the record year after year after year means either we have an epidemic of either amnesia in this country or guns. Now, I think we probably all will settle on the fact that it's guns. But and if you prefer, if you really want to be particular about it, we might have an epidemic of dishonest gun owners who not only are forgetful and don't practice gun safety and forget that they're even armed in the first place, but then when they're discovered to have been armed, uh, insist that they had forgotten all about it and didn't know anything on, gosh, it's my it's my usual commute bag that I bring a gun in. And I, I just slipped my mind. So I don't know, one problem or another, take your pick, amnesia, guns or irresponsible dishonest gun owners none of them are particularly good uh no real evidence for the amnesia case there so anyway it was just interesting to see people who i think follow gun violence issues pretty closely be surprised that this was the case and uh, you all get to lean back smugly and uh, say you knew all about it all along uh, all the more smugly if you're not traveling anywhere this week so all right anyway Greg, who has traveled all the way from Connecticut via Skype, wasn't very hard, but, uh, you know, we appreciate the effort, is here and ready with a raft of stories and waiting patiently. So good morning, Greg. How are you? Good morning. Well, I'm doing fine. I, my, my current working theory is that there's uh, too much lead in the water at airports. That may be. Uh, there's certainly plenty of lead in the, uh, we've learned this, uh, lead in the air at the shooting ranges. So if you're actually practicing a whole lot, you're probably getting a high dose. Anyway. Right. And the thing about Skype. Yes. Uh, for those of you who are longtime listeners, yes, uh, you know that I generally yeah. call in and talk to David on Skype, and sometimes Skype even rates our calls. Oh, yes. Which well, is really yes, nice. Yes. But uh, the issue here is that I use it for the phone conversation, mm -hmm. which isn't really a phone, on our radio show, which isn't really right. radio. So and uh, I send a list of things that maybe I'll talk about, maybe I won't. Usually I send a lot more things that I actually talk about yes. than if I'm the time. And comments. And but, pictures. Uh, yeah, I also send pictures. Right. And uh, normally that's not a problem. But for whatever oh. reason today, Skype is mm -hmm. being deliberately slow with publishing the pictures huh. that I'm sending. And so uh, it's important, and now I realize this is what the uh, modern equivalent is to radio, and you can't see the graphs and charts of the polls that I send to David, They're but there. he needs them so that he could have some informed commentary that I can then talk over and not let him talk, <laughs> not let him, you know, which is a, a cooperative uh, uh, listening, as we like to call yes. it here on the show. This chart has a big piece of pie, and it's red. Uh, so uh, were, like were any of the pictures able to show? Because they're not showing up at my end. Uh, well, let's see. What pictures are we looking for? I don't know. Uh, yeah, these all well, look like illustrations. If, if, with the... if you find these blank uh, gray <laughs> swaths, <laughs> that's what I'm looking at here. Well, I see one or two pictures. But, uh, yeah, usually. No, I... Des Moines uh, record, Iowa polls. 
for example. Uh, yeah. Oh, is this the uh, the pie charts? I see yeah. some pie charts. There we go. Okay, good, good. You got them. So that's yeah, yeah. Nice. Okay, so there's some. Now, I don't here. want people to think that we make this stuff as we go along. You know, we, we've right. carefully orchestrated everything we're going to say weeks in advance. Oh, well, I was going to say we make it up after, but okay. Yeah, here's here's a great example. So today's pundit roundup, yes. which I think we should, uh, you know, at least uh, discuss and dispose of. Yes, you've written it. We might as well use it. Right. Uh, was the aftermath of the Kyle Rittenhouse uh, mm. yes. verdict. Everyone had a great uh, weekend contemplating that one. Right. And, you know, uh, it may also be possible, by the way, that what happened at the airport is that that fellow just figured the TSA folks are going to be interviewing him and his opinion of the Kyle Rittenhouse verdict. And he just needed this prop. Right. And that's why he lunched. I for forgot. It. I have to go get it very quickly. Yes. Yeah, yes. So you asked me about it. So Rittenhouse is innocent, uh, and this should come as no surprise. That's what they call it, yeah. Because Well, he's acquitted anyway. Right. Uh, the civil trials hopefully are still to come, and he'll be guilty there, but that's a different story because uh, criminal uh, guilt yes, in this liability. particular case is a difficult thing to achieve. Yes, we did not. And I think one of the things that, that you know, uh, this has helped us realize if you haven't realized it already – is that it isn't just an issue of uh, white on black violence. This it's also an that. issue of white on white violence. Yes, that's uh, what this was. That makes it difficult to uh, convict somebody when they're using the concept of self-defense. Now, Jennifer Rogers had a really nice piece in CNN uh, to explain this. Mm. And wrote this, the trial came down to two dueling narratives. To the prosecutors, Rittenhouse was a vigilante with an AR-style 15 weapon who went looking for trouble, which is in fact what happened. Yes. To the defense, Rittenhouse was the sobbing teenager who testified that he found himself under attack and those lightning fast moments made a reasonable decision to protect himself, which also may well have been true in those yes, lightning fast Both of fast those moments. things did happen. That's true. Yeah. So the jury clearly believed the latter, which given the facts, the law and other circumstances is no surprise. She also writes, the case was always going to be an uphill battle for prosecutors. The key issue yes. was whether Rittenhouse acted in self-defense, which means he reasonably feared for his life when he pulled the trigger and shot Joseph Rosenbaum, Anthony Hubert, and George Grosskreutz that night. Trying to weigh Rittenhouse self-defense claim and the two dueling narratives isn't an easy job for the jury. One could reasonably argue Rittenhouse provoked the attacks. Um, yes. Even if defending himself, if the jury had found either of these things to be true, it would have defeated the self-defense claim. But there was also evidence, including critical video and the testimony of Rittenhouse himself, that in the key moment right before he pulled the trigger, he acted in response to imminent threat. Hmm. Now, the law and applicable legal standard, and a lot of lawyers told me this both on and offline prior to the verdict, creates a tough road for prosecutors trying to win a conviction the criminal justice system generally favors the defendant because of our core belief that it's better to see a guilty man go free than convict an innocent one. You could add, unless you're black, but, you know, we'll skip this for the moment. Okay. Thus, in criminal cases, prosecutors carry the highest burden of proof known to our legal system, proof beyond reasonable doubt. Now, you don't need that in a civil case. Right. True. Like in many other states. Wisconsin law is sympathetic to homicide defendants claiming self-defense. Once a defendant raises self-defense as an issue, it requires the law, that is. Mm -hmm. It requires prosecutors to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant didn't act in self-defense. And that's really tough to prove. And that's why all the lawyers that were talking to me saying, look, he's going to get off. Maybe he gets a misdemeanor for carrying the gun, except it turns out in Wisconsin law, even that's not true because of the nature right. of the gun. Yes, Long gun, enough. short barreled rifle, etc. That mattered in terms of technicalities of the law. So he gets off. He did. And, you know, that's not surprising. Uh, now, that doesn't mean he's a good guy. Paige Williams writes in The New Yorker, Wisconsin self-defense law made it difficult for the jury to convict an outcome that was celebrated the Republican Party's violent fringe. Now, uh, we also have to put this in perspective. It's bad if, for example, Trump wins in 2016. 
but it also means you have to put up with the people celebrating that he won and, and uh, you know, oh, saying right. we won, you lost tribal sports kind of, you know, Red Sox uh, talking to Yankee fans kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Yes. And uh, that's unavoidable. Right. Okay. So whatever the meaning in the law for Rittenhouse's verdict, it also has all this other stuff attached to it, too, which just makes it worse. And that's why if, uh, for example, some guy fleeing from a crime scene in a car runs over a bunch of people at a parade, it takes outsized uh, meaning. Mm, Yes. Uh, That happened in Wisconsin. Uh, Somebody uh, in Connecticut ran over Black Lives Matter protesters. Uh, You know, using cars as a weapon is bad. Fleeing from a crime and hitting people isn't any better, but it's It's a different sort of thing. So. Uh, very difficult to uh, interpret things that you hear at first blush because usually the first things you hear are wrong. So uh, I'll just say that there's a case out there and CNN is reporting the guy was a uh, known bad guy who was fleeing from the cops when all this happened. And let's, uh, you know, let the reporters sort out what actually happens. Yes. Well, try, crime is terrorism. You're terrorizing uh, Mark the, Fisher and Mark Berman write in the, the Washington countryside. Post after Rittenhouse will deadly clashes multiplies the right to self defense expands. That's really the issue here. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right. Uh, in America's courts, law schools, and state legislatures, a quieter yet still fitful struggle has waged over the past couple of decades focused on the central dilemma raised anew by Rittenhouse. What does a right to self defense really mean? When can Americans choose to use deadly force? Who gets to decide? And as often happens in the legal realm, these essentially moral questions get lost in Talmudic thicket of criminal code. Hmm. The problem here isn't the law. Billy Martin, a prominent D.C. defense attorney, yeah. not the uh, uh, formerly alive uh, New York yes. Yankees manager, uh, Billy death. Martin, who formerly headed the homicide division of the U.S. Attorney's Office in Washington, said Saturday, it's the state of mind right now, the acceptance of society, the ability to have weapons and use them to defend yourself. You're seeing a more receptive attitude among jurors. For people mm-hmm. to arm and defend themselves if they reasonably believe their life is being threatened. Yes, well, that's where things go wrong. Yeah, and that's where things are. Matt Glassman, that political scientist, says, you know, Rittenhouse is an idiot, not a hero. Allowing 17-year-olds to open carry AR-15s is bad law, and the justice system is often miserable to non-whites, but idiots operating under bad law still deserve just trials. Mm-hmm. Denying them that doesn't improve anything for anybody. Luckily, civil trials can, and in this case likely will, find fault as well, bad laws can be changed, and the justice system can be improved. All worthy avenues given this outcome, all better than seeking a criminal conviction that matches moral desert, but not law. So the law says he was innocent. Moral code says he's guilty. You can't convict somebody based on a moral code, even though you'd like to. Right, not in our system. Not in our system. So that's where things stand. So that's why it wasn't a surprise when that particular thing happened. Hmm. Yes, well, uh, yeah, the odds were stacked against uh, the prosecution for sure. Not every state treats self-defense the same way, but uh, but they do. And we've been talking about that for a while. That and the stand-your-ground laws, which hope to even short-circuit that stacked deck by saying we can settle this before we even go to trial. There won't even be uh, a, uh, a Rittenhouse trial under... Stand your ground doctrine. We just don't charge him. Right. So uh, related and wrapped around that Hmm. and uh, relevant to the idea that the the other tribe is uh, celebrating. Yes. Is this piece by Caitlin Fawcett and Politico. Why Republicans can't stop talking about masculinity. Oh, boy. A QA and a with historian Kristen Cobes Dumez on Josh Hawley, J.D. Vance and why manhood seems to be such a big topic on the right. Which I thought was interesting. Yeah. Republican lawmakers and hopefuls seem particularly interested in the idea of masculinity lately. In a TV interview, Missouri Senator Josh Hawley claimed the left was telling men their masculinity is inherently problematic. I feel like every time I turn around, someone says that. Yeah, well, with a rifle. He also told interviewer Mike Allen he'd make masculinity a signature political issue. All these comments (laughs) sounded similar to those of Representative Madison Cawthorn in North Carolina, who went viral last month in a video calling on mothers to raise their sons to be monsters. Yay. Just like the founders intended. 
just like the monster who said that. Right. Today's culture, Kwanthan said, is trying to demasculate all young men because they don't want people who are going to stand up. That, that's uh, why all this stuff's relative to the Rittenhouse thing. Mm -hmm. More recently, Ohio Senate candidate J.D. Vance, who, by the way, is going to lose to an even nuttier guy, sounded similar themes in a series of tweets in which he defended Kyle Rittenhouse, the 18-year-old who was acquitted on Friday of all charges in the shootings of three men in the aftermath of the dem uh, demonstrations in Kenosha. Vance tweeted that the trial filled him with indescribable rage because oh. it's important to have white guys filled with rage. We leave our boys without fathers. We let the wolves set fire to their communities, he said. That's and when human nature tells them to go and defend what no one else is defending, we bring the full weight of the state and the global monopolists against them. The global monopolists. Okay, sure. Now, uh, there's an interesting twist on this that the historian Kristen Cobes Dumez brings, which I wanted to mention. Uh, but also, you know, before getting into that, it is also worth mentioning that there's actually something to the concept that, uh, you know, these guys are bringing. Uh, generally speaking, young white men do feel like they have to go out and prove themselves and uh, getting into fights and stuff like that is essentially human nature. It's not good. It needs to be regulated. That's where the moral code comes in. But the reason you need a moral code is left to its own devices. You know, you put uh, uh, five guys in different sports uh, teams in a bar and give them enough beer, they're going to have a fight. Probably true. It's just going to happen. So, you know, denying that that's the case isn't the way to go. And that's where the moral code comes in. So you'd hope a moral code would help to say, okay, I know you want to punch that guy in the mouth. And for all I know, he deserves it. But don't. Yes, that and then if that fun. doesn't work, then there's the law, you know, and, and so that's how it all follows. And that's your abbreviated uh, pundit roundup to how things developed the way they did. Yeah. Well, so uh, according to historian Kristen Cobes de Mez, this way of talking about masculinity also has its roots in conservative evangelical spaces. Mm -hmm. I found that interesting because I just don't think commentators carry, uh, cover enough of how white evangelical thought, voting practice, etc., is influencing where we are today in 2021. It's so integral to the current Republican Party, but people are afraid to say it. Yeah, interesting. It really could make a an interesting study, just historically. Just I'm thinking about uh, where white evangelical Christian politics used to be way, way back. You know, a uh, hundred years ago, uh, they were the temperance society because they knew that putting five guys in a room with enough beer would cause a fight. And they said, why don't we take the beer out of the picture and yeah, see if we can't we can get rid of their fist, the fight. So let's get rid of the beer. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> I mean, it worked. Sort of course, 100 of, years before true, that, but... you got rid of their fist. But, yeah, you know. right. Yeah. Well, and they still do that in Saudi Arabia. So, yeah. Dumez wrote a book last year called hmm. Jesus and John Wayne, A White <laughs> Evangelicals Corrupted a Faith and Fractured a Nation. Sure. Now, that is a great title. Yeah. All right. About how the model of masculinity and evangelicalism went from emulating the qualities of Jesus to emulating those of John Wayne and how that has shaped culture and politics ever since. Holly Vance and Cawthorn all have deep ties to evangelical Christianity and frequently reference the importance of faith in their lives and especially for Cawthorn and Horley because Vance is a 24 karat phony in their political philosophies. Uh, I added the phony part, but it's true. I spoke with Dumez about the history of masculinity as an idea in Republican politics and why it's suddenly so popular. The conversation has been edited and condensed. Uh, Katie right. Fawcett, when you heard these comments from Holly and Vance recently, given your background, what did you hear? And uh, Kristen Cobes Dumez says, I'll start with Holly. Within conservative evangelical spaces, first of all, there's the idea that masculinity is a God-given thing. When Hawley's talking oh. about an attack on men and saying that the left is attacking manhood and they hate this country and don't believe in gender, all of that sounds familiar. In white evangelicalism, this has been a refrain for decades. In evangelical spaces, Christian manhood has long been equated with a kind of rugged, militant quality. Since the 60s, conservative evangelicals have elevated a more militant ideal of masculinity, one that's both provider and protector. That's our God-given duty as men. And so when I heard Hawley talk about courage and independence, it's similar to how masculinity is discussed in these spaces. Often, rather than assertiveness, they substitute aggressiveness. And again, you know, I go back to, uh, and this is a gender testosterone-related thing, but 
there's something to the idea that young uh, males do tend to be more aggressive. And in fact, uh, uh, evangelical uh, spaces that build on that to twist it to their own ends aren't starting from scratch or making stuff up. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. It works because there is something to that. The question is what you do about it. And, you know, uh, uh, pushing the wrong things, uh, that it's good to be aggressive and assertive rather than, you know, control and moral code on top of it is a better oh. thing, you know, is, is one of the reasons why we are where we are. And that's why yes. I thought this piece was so interesting. It is interesting. Reminds me of one we read years ago about uh, MMA ministries that uh, certainly fits in that niche. They, yeah, they, definitely. They taught them, oh, the way to reach out to one another is by punching and kicking one another. Oh. Yeah. So, uh, again, there's uh, a number of other approaches to the uh, uh, Rittenhouse trial that you can come to. One of them is an interesting one here. Right. Andrew Craigie posts, what about North Carolina? What about laws in North Carolina? Okay. Interestingly, in most cases, unless you qualify for a specific exemption, it's illegal in North Carolina to carry a weapon to a protest. Oh. So the idea that the law Not simply real. is always written to favor Kyle Rittenhouse type vigilantes isn't true even in conservative states yeah so there's a lot you could do to just make it better that's one of the things i guess so i mean yeah i have a hard time i, I wonder about how well they uh, uh enforce that one and i guess it probably has a little bit to do with what you're protesting and how well you know the local well but sheriff. that's why there might be yeah. some common ground there maybe I right. don't think so. You don't want BLM people bringing guns right. to protest, do you? Just right. ban guns and protest. Just yeah. do it. Well, we've been through this. That's uh, how we got gun control laws in the first place, as I understand it, uh, during the, during the, or at least the modern version of it, during the '60s when uh, Black well, Panthers you know, began. It's to the happen. David Shore theory of social advancement. Oh. No. <laughs> yeah, you know, you got to account for the fact that you have a bunch of uh, white non-college folks and just make it palatable to them. Hmm. All right. Sup fam, it's your boy Darwin, aka Darwin underscore Darbo, aka the most reasonable man in America, aka KITM's senior black correspondent. You might remember me from such recordings as Spacemen vs. Space Cadets and we Need to Talk About Joe Biden. Today, I want to bring you good news about that thing you've been struggling with. Do you suffer from giving too much of a damn? Do you turn on the series of tubes and find yourself outraged at the particular way some news organization strung some sentences together only to realize, nope, this is not some fictional hellscape? Well, guess what? You no longer have to accept a life of giving too much of a damn. You can do something about it because even you, yes you, can be a show contributor. Now I know what you're thinking. Hey, Mr. Most Reasonable Man in America, I'm not some professional podcast talking guy. Don't worry about it. Do you have a smartphone or some other electronic recording device? Well, that's all you need. You too can have a segment where you can read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Fair warning though, side effects may include general punditry, having opinions and hot takes, getting stuff off your chest, and hearing your own voice. If your recording lasts longer than five to seven minutes, please consult kagorx at gmail.com. That's K-A-G-R-O-X at gmail.com. All right, welcome back now to the Kagor in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. We continue with Greg Dworkin here to uh, help us round things up. It was, was a more exciting weekend than I uh, initially realized, I guess. There was a lot going on. Well, there's a lot going on. So, uh, meanwhile, the Build Back Better Disney, Act is headed yes. to the Senate. Right, true. Uh, that happened when? Friday? Yeah. So, it happened uh, probably during morning. your show that they had that vote. Yes, that's right. So, let's talk about that. that a little bit. Okay. We know that Thursday night, you probably covered it on Friday, that uh, Kevin McCarthy was up all night so I was speaking to no one for eight right. and a half hours, and nobody remembers what he said or that he did it. What people remember is that uh, Nancy Pelosi got her thing passed. Yeah, and I mean, now that it's passed, there were no lines and it's anymore. done. There's a couple of things that are worth mentioning. First of all, her strategy about linking and then delinking the bills worked. Yes. Worked in the sense that in you have a razor thin majority with people who don't agree, and she got it passed anyway. Yeah, it's remarkable. Passed. Uh, yes, still got work to do in the Senate, but uh, it's looking good. Momentum. Her works. job isn't the Senate. She's right. not there to, to babysit the Senate. Although, interesting, that. the New York Times had a piece 
about how one of the reasons Pelosi got this to pass is that she was babysitting the Senate. Yeah. It it turns That's out it. she's been point. good friends with Joe Manchin for a long time, and she really gets along well with Kristen, uh, Kirsten Cinema. How? And so she had a lot of back channels I see. to them. Even after she was annoyed that Chuck Schumer did not tell her that Schumer and Manchin had signed a, a uh, letter of intent to attend the Ohio State. No, uh, <laughs> they signed a letter of intent that they were going to agree on certain things about the bill. They did that. They didn't tell her. She was working in the dark. She got it done anyway. Pretty good. So uh, yeah, they, part of the uh, reason mm -hmm. is that Pelosi, who's been around forever, I mean, the kid has a future in politics, I would think, based on what she did, uh, yeah. happens to be really good friends with Manchin, with cinema, with Schumer, and mm -hmm. with Biden. And those connections really mattered because when Schumer and Biden and uh, Pelosi uh, would meet or be on the phone, they got stuff done. They just had really good chemistry. Does that matter in politics? You're damn right it does. It does, yes. Uh, one of the reasons is that people are very sensitive at highest levels because they're good at this, and you wouldn't get to highest levels if you weren't good at this, uh, about face saving. So they made sure that nobody really uh, had to eat it too much. Right. And the idea that the progressives were going to block this or that the moderates were going to block this just was never true. Hmm. Not the way she set it up. She set it up so that they couldn't. Not that they didn't or that they wouldn't, but that they couldn't. Hmm. And it took longer than she wished because the Senate, mostly, because every single time something would happen, somebody in the Senate would say, well, we're not ready yet, or we don't like this, or I'm saying publicly that. that that's not a good idea, and she'd have to adjust. And one of the things that she'd have to adjust is Manchin was back channel and Cinema was back channel talking to the moderates in her caucus. And then they would say something after she thought it was worked out. And so she'd have to go back and read. But she did this constantly. She did it without blaming anybody. She got it done. Pretty good. Now, other people deserve credit. Sure. Jayapal, uh, the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, the progressives. A lot of people uh, get credit because that's what happens. You know, victory has a thousand voters, defeat is an orphan. But basically, without Pelosi, it doesn't happen. That's, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's a, probably a, a fair read of it. And uh, interesting point also that you were making about it, the Senate being not her problem, but at the same time, yes, it is. Uh, taking the approach of trying to make sure that you pass something that you think has a fair chance of surviving the Senate. Occasionally, they will pass messaging bills that they say, all right, we know this won't pass the Senate, but it doesn't matter. We're going to do it anyway. This is obviously one that they want to get through and under reconciliation rules might get through. So, it took a lot of extra care and a lot of extra work to get something through that was popular enough with the the House caucus and still stood a chance in the Senate. And I guess that's where those back channels come in because, you know. Right. Back yeah, channels. How good a problem. vote counter is Pelosi? Pretty damn good. The only Democrat that voted against this is Jared Golden. And God knows why. I'm not even going there. Uh, yeah, I have no idea. He changed the channel. I mean, she even got the usual other players who uh, normally vote no to vote yes. Yeah. Uh, not certain whether there was any conversation between the two of them, Golden and Pelosi, about his, you know, alleged need to vote no. That might have might have come as a surprise to her, but not so much. Well, no, I mean, do, it, but, uh, it was going to be a Thursday vote. And then yeah. uh, Kevin McCarthy pulled his stunt. And so it was a Friday vote. But on Thursday, before all of that. Steny Hoyer said, this is going to pass. The only one I know who's voting against it is Jared Golden. Ah. Oh, so, okay. So he told them so. Uh, sometimes if you uh, don't answer the whip call, they know what that means, too. They just And, know, and, and it, it turned out that was exactly what the vote was. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, they're good at that. The other thing that's uh, important in terms of Pelosi's discussion and what happened in the back channel is that after it passed and she had her uh, press conference, mm -hmm. okay, Somebody asked her about, well, what happens in the Senate? She said, don't worry about it. Ninety percent of this bill is going to pass the Senate. Ninety percent of this bill is going to be acceptable. Something good will come out of the Senate. And this is one of those situations where knowing her relationship with Cinema and Mansion, that's not just talk. Hmm. All right. 
Yeah, well, good. Uh, I don't know which 90%. But no, we don't know. I mean, see. paid family leave may go. Uh, Medicare expansion to cover hearing may go. We don't know. Yeah. But all, all we, do know, we do know something's likely to happen. Seahill Kapoor summarizes it this way. The Build Back Better Act headed to the Senate will be revised to win all 50 Democrats and comply with reconciliation rules. Key provisions to watch. Four weeks paid leave, immigration, parole, 80,000 salt cap, added Medicare benefits. Those are the things likely to be on the chopping block, which doesn't mean that they get chopped. Uh, could have a pardon okay. for Thanksgiving. Uh, we don't know. All right. But but it, something will happen. And yeah. so after that, you get all of this stuff done. So uh, for all of the, you know, and, and again, uh, it was the Obama era uh, political consultants like Plough. Uh, you know, who who basically uh, uh, made this famous by calling their fellow Democrats bedwetters. But there's a lot of truth in that, because despite all the hand wringing or bedwetting or whatever you want to call it, mm. this thing passed, uh, yeah. which did not come as a surprise to me. I thought it would. Presidents generally get what they want from their own parties. That's why I think it'll pass the Senate in some form. Mm -hmm. And is it not enough? Is it too much? Is it this? Is it that? Just stop. You know, uh, Pelosi's well, right. It's just historic. It's transformative. It's amazing what does pass. And no, you're not going to get everything you want, but you got to have more votes to do that. Well, what about the Voting Rights Act? Why didn't you do that? We don't have the votes. Yeah, and it's. I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, but if you don't have the votes, you can't get stuff done. And if you do, you can get stuff done. It is that simple. And that's why uh, Pelosi brings certain things to the floor and doesn't bring other things to the floor, pushes some things, but not others. Yeah, well. That is uh, that's true. We can't bring uh, the voting rights bill under the reconciliation rules. We've tried that. I mean, you can change the rules. That's true too. But again, uh, I mean, is Pelosi going to spend House floor time on things when she's able to tell that the Senate isn't ready to do what it needs to do in order to pass these things over the objections of filibustering Republicans? Well, probably not. And the best signal you'll get. Uh, is uh, when it, well, if they do move it, they'll either tell you, yeah, we're doing it despite the Senate as a messaging bill, or we've heard that uh, the Senate actually is ready to do something about this and that. that or we, or we've heard the Senate's actually interested in, in doing this uh, with committee work, uh, mm. with, you know, uh, joint uh, committee after, you yeah. know. So when you get those signals, you have an idea something's going on here behind the scenes. Yes, so. All right. Well, that is interesting. Uh, and a good point. Those, uh, there was a lot of work that went into getting this thing passed. And uh, yeah, I didn't know really so much about the, her connections with Mansion and Cinema. I don't know how or where she would have had the chance to develop the relationship with Kirsten Cinema. She was typically well, Cinema was in the house. Yeah, she was very briefly. And, you know, almost as brief as she's been. In let, let, let's pretend for a moment that Pelosi likes to mentor women, even though she doesn't give up any of her leadership roles. <laughs> OK, that's true. Uh, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure she came into contact with her. I just am curious about how how much of a relationship could they have. Developed. There's a lot of women in the house. As yeah, but cinema, cinema is a standout for a lot that of reasons, is true. Not, not just the way she dresses. But stand apart. As well as stand out. Yes. So it's yeah, hard to yeah. get to know her. And yet, you know, you have to go back and look at her voting record and see how often she voted with leadership, which I haven't done. Yeah. Democrats' child care plan could be a historic achievement, but also comes with risk. Okay, then. This is one of those things where it's wonderful. Uh, but the question is, uh, does it expire? Oh, okay. All right. This is a political argument. All right. Because... Uh, if it expires, then it doesn't cost as much as if it doesn't. But if it expires, it requires uh, you to renew it. Yes. Okay. So therefore, how do you count the money? Do you count it as, well, the, look, the literal law says it expires. Therefore, you can't count what happens if it's renewed. So it doesn't cost that much. You got to count that. Or do you count it as, yes, but it's so important you'll never let it expire and therefore you're going to renew it. So we should count that as well. No to that. No to that. You really can't because you, you can't guarantee in this day and age anything about right. it absolutely will be renewed. You don't know that. Uh, particularly, you know, with a Republican uh, House and Senate. Yeah. So you just don't know. 
So historic and transformative are the right adjectives, Heather Bushy, a top economic advisor to President Joe Biden, told Huffington Post in a recent interview. But writing legislation is hard. Oh, yeah, by the way, this stuff had to be written as well. I mean, we sort of gloss over that. Okay, well, the committees will do his work, and then let's talk to politics. That work is difficult. It is. They have a very specialized crew of people who who handle that. Yeah, Uh, it's it is tough. You just you don't you don't just get to say, all right, well, we agreed on sixty million dollars for dental health care. Okay, but yeah, I can't just say, here's sixty million dollars. Go find some teeth. I mean, (laughs) you got to have a program, right? How do I deal with that? Yeah, well, they leave it up to the Office of Legislative Counsel to do that. Mm. So uh, writing legislation is hard and passing it is harder, especially in a politically divided country where the public overwhelmingly says it doesn't trust government. Mm. And that theme is going to come up uh, in a few minutes when we look at how Biden is doing. And a variety of institutional factors tilt power in Congress away from lawmakers eager to expand public programs. So the architects of the plan crafted it with those constraints in mind, and then Congress scaled it back even further, and the final product reflects those decisions. All right. So most important, the appropriation ends in 2027, making the program survival completely dependent on a future Congress and president agreeing to extend it. Yes. And that's a strategic choice made under pressure for more conservative Democrats who were determined to limit the legislation's overall cost. Why? Why was it so important to limit the cost uh, when things like Department of Defense don't have those sort of constraints? Hmm. It doesn't matter why. I mean, sure, if you want to change their mind or explain it, but the fact is it was. And so you had to do it. Okay. yes, well, that's true. And uh, reconciliation has a lot to do with it, too. Ordinarily limits things to the 10 year window. Right. So So, uh, step back and look and say, how did uh, Democrats get to be where they are? Well, uh, part of the reason is that in crafting these things, which are good governance, They generally make a terrible case for why it's good for people. And so a lot of the arguments you're going to hear uh, are why Democrats are so bad at this. For example, here's one from uh, Jonathan Shea. Remember the Jonathan Corner? We haven't talked about them for a while. Uh, This is in New York Magazine. Joe Biden's big squeeze. Progressive donors to the left of him, cynical centrists to the right of him, a theory of why his popular agenda is so unpopular. Is it? Okay, let's have the theory. Well, uh, he's having trouble. The grim irony is that in attempting to court non-white voters, Democrats ended up turning him off. The non-white voters? This goes back to the uh, Southern Texas uh, didn't vote for Democrats theory that I have. It was not only that they got the data wrong, they were also courting the marginalized communities in ways that didn't appeal to them. For the reality is, the Democratic Party's most moderate voters are disproportionately Latino and black, Mm -hmm. which we know. They weren't ready uh, to uh, uh, vote for Barack Obama back in 2008 until they were. You and I experienced that when we went to a convention together. (laughs) <laughs> yes with, uh, but remember yeah. with the uh no, I the uh, uh black shriners yes that i remember were they who, uh yeah who said to us you know that, i yeah. hope you realize we're not voting for obama just because he's black well, hillary clinton has been in our corner you know et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Ah, that was yes. 2008 okay. right true uh, 2007 actually um and uh you have to convince 2008 yeah you have to convince those voters that uh, your candidate's going to win, not just that it would benefit them to have those policies. Yes, they were overwhelmingly, uh, there was an overwhelming wave of early support for Joe Biden this time around, Uh, also coming from uh, minority voters that might who you might who you might actually uh, describe as conservative to a certain extent we like to call them moderates but they're relatively conservative voters in the sense that you know you got something new you better show me this new stuff's going to work yeah there was a lot of frankly we don't trust white voters so you better give us somebody who white (laughs) voters will vote for because we can't do it on our own we know it right and if you're too stupid to know that that's because you're not listening to us Mm, yeah pretty much i mean yeah i think we learned a lot about that during the the early primaries all right, so that's uh, Chait's point here. Okay. Then. In 2020, even as Biden improved on Clinton's performance among white voters, black support for Trump rose by three points from four years before Latino support rose eight. 
the California recall election and Virginia governor's race this year both showed at least some evidence that Latino voters are continuing to slip away from Democrats. The 2021 New York mayoral elections were marked by heavily Asian American neighborhoods flipping Republican. Confounding the liberal assumption that immigrant communities demand more lenient border policies, many signs suggest the swing is a result of wanting stricter enforcement. Oh, right? okay. Some of Trump's largest games came in the Mexican-American precincts in Texas. Biden's approval rating among Hispanic Texans stood at 37% in late September, with 26% approving of his handling of the border. Their dismay was not that Biden had deported too many immigrants. They wanted... Haitians deported. I mean, this is the kind of stuff you have to balance when you have a coalition. I guess so. Right? And, of course, the split within the Democratic Party runs across educational lines. And the big danger for white liberals is that you get your college vote and you even increase it by a couple of points. And that doesn't matter because you lose a lot more with non-college whites and non-college non-whites. So education matters. When confronted with the reality that the Democratic Party is losing black and Latino moderates, the response on the left is often to treat their views as morally beyond the pale. Right. Mm -hmm. You could see the allure of the jackpot authoritarian thuggery offered by modern Republicans, wrote the nation's Ely uh, Ely Mistel. Okay. yes, that's not going to give you votes. He may be right. But so what? Mm. (laughs) That doesn't get you votes. Nobody's proposing Democrats run on authoritarian thuggery. The question is whether any compromise with the center is acceptable. And so, you know, that's something we struggle with. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we do. I don't know. I'm not certain whether I take solutions out of that or not. But okay, points. And so uh, this is another one. This is from Roy Teixeira. Democrats can reach more working class voters, but they'll have to ditch the woke stuff. Oh, boy. And this comes from a, a Jacobin study, uh, Center oh. for Working Class Studies in YouGov. Progressive triumphs have been con- concentrated in well-educated, relatively high-income and heavily Democratic districts. Even when progressives have won primaries in working class areas, they've generally done so without increasing total turnout. And in races outside the friendly terrain of the blue state metropolis, the same progressive candidates have largely struggled. Overall, progressives had not yet made good on one key promise of their campaigns to transform and expand the electorate. You may remember when Bernie was running uh, way back when in 2016, his claim was he's going to bring people into the process that don't usually vote. Well, I suppose he did, but a lot of them voted for Trump. (laughs) It may be, I I guess if you fault him for bringing them in, uh, that could have been Trump himself, but I guess. Oh, but if you don't fault him yeah. for bringing them in, then he didn't bring them in. So either way, right. <laughs> it didn't, work didn't happen. It didn't happen yeah. the way it was uh, proposed. Well, that's, uh, they would say that's because you didn't nominate him. <laughs> well, uh, pose a major challenge to any well, hope for a national Austin, political though. realignment on progressive terms. Recent events suggest that left-wing candidates may continue to replace moderate Democrats in demographically favorable urban districts, but the national picture is less promising. So basically, what Chait and Cheshire are both saying is that uh, for the kind of majority necessary to pass, this is in the uh, uh, Jackman study, big ticket items on the social democratic agenda, progressive candidates will need to win in far wider range of places. Until they do, their political leverage will remain sharply limited at the local, state, and national levels. And Cheshire says, in other words, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez can win in New York 14. But those candidates are no solution to the Democrats' working class problems in most areas of the country. So what to do? Increased support among working class voters is a necessity, not optional. The Jacobin study, based on sophisticated testing of which types of candidates both uh, working class voters prefer, illuminates the approach Democrats should take if they wish to make progress. The study finds that working class voters prefer progressive candidates who focus primarily on bread and butter economic issues, and who frame the issues in universal terms, especially true outside deep blue parts of the country. For example, then this is me. Uh, well, let, let's give his example. He says, for example, okay. candidates employing woke messaging who championed either centrist or progressive economic health care or civil rights policy were viewed less favorably than their counterparts who championed the same priorities but opted for universalist messaging. Ted Cruz is on TV now accusing the Democrats of basically being communists. Okay. And we used to laugh at that. Yes. But uh, that's going to have salience in South Texas. And it's going to have salience 
in Miami? And uh, if your answer to that is, you know, we have to, uh, you know, double down on critical race theory rather than talk about how the economy is getting better, we're going to lose. Again, my theory, uh, we lost Texas and probably Florida because Democrats were seen as championing shutdowns and Republicans were seen as championing, uh, you know, keep the jobs there and keep places open. We know the risk. Or we think we know the risk or we're willing to take the risk because they got to put food on the table. I mean, that's just bread and butter economics. And you're not going to trump that with, uh, well, I'm happy with I'm unhappy with what the schools are teaching Mm. or doing about what the schools are teaching or making schools an issue. You know, it's bread and butter economics. And Democrats have to get back to that if they're going to win. All right. Well, I mean, it's said. I mean, it's the economy. stupid. It still is. Yeah. (laughs) I yeah I, I guess I just uh, I don't know it's uh, difficult to tell for me when they're when they think they're departing from it but they'll you know, speak up and uh, say so I know that uh, Brendan Nyhan, political scientist I don't have this in front of me the quote but uh, you know said something fairly salient about the fact that look you know uh, when you have thermostatic change and you're going to lose because the other party's in the White House then everybody has a theory about why this isn't what you need to do about it. And frankly, it doesn't make all that much difference. Yeah, uh, that's that could certainly be the answer, right? Uh, so that's part of it, but you can make it worse. What it is. Yes. Uh, so don't make it worse. Uh, right. Here's an example of Biden uh, countering that. Okay. Uh, President Biden will nominate Jerome Powell for another term as chairman of the Federal Reserve, says uh, Jennifer Epstein. Okay. From Bloomberg. Lael Brainerd, who many on the left urged him to choose for chair, is going to be Biden's pick for vice chair. All right. So if the media presents this as Biden picked the centrist, not the leftist, fine. Okay. He could use that right now. Why? I like leftists, but I also like winning elections. Mm, Yes. Well, okay. I didn't realize that was such a big thing, but I'm not a follower of the... uh... These selections of the on the Fed, so uh, look, but you know, you, you'd make it whatever it is you make it of. So you know, what's important is gas prices come down, mm-hmm. that uh, unemployment goes Happy. down. Happy. The uh, the big boxes don't have a supply chain issue right now. What supply chain issue? They're full, right? Uh, you know, and uh, that stuff needs to sink in, and so you pound that. People are saying, well, Biden should make a speech. You don't make a speech. Speeches mm-hmm. don't change minds. Waste mm-hmm. of time. I don't watch them. They don't change my mind. Yeah, for example. Right. Uh, yeah, I'm very white working class when it comes to watching the speeches. <laughs> I don't do it either. And I don't know right. why, if it's the same reason or not. Uh, you know, others, perhaps because they're, they're polishing guns or working very hard on their automobiles or something like that. Whereas I am, uh, I don't know, reading uh, Greek tragedy. Not true. Not in either case. But we're both not watching. That's the bottom line. Okay. Speech right. thing out the window. Sure. Uh, now, there are openings here. Uh, E.J. Dion has a piece, The GOP Bets on Resentment Over Problem Solving. Now, resentment has sure. its charms, has its charms. We have to you know, be aware mm. of that. Yes. Uh, but you should have a counter for it, but you should also have a counter and a pivot. Okay. You know, yes. which is to say, look, this isn't about whether or not CRT is uh, you know, uh, taught in schools. It's about whether or not you're actually going to go so far as book burning. But more importantly, we're talking about putting jobs on the table, you oh, know, and I'm not going to get bogged down. You want to keep talking about CRT, go ahead. I've pivoted the jobs. Ah. Oh, I see. All right. So you could do it that way. Yes. Uh, I mean, I do think that there's certainly opportunity and, and that's maybe the place to, to put down the marker where you can pivot is uh, Republicans, well, they have a tendency to do this. And I guess maybe all people do, but Republicans and most famously, uh, have the tendency to overreach when they meet with a little bit of success, which is right you now, you know, CRT the other piece is to look at the data and, you know, take a little comfort from it. There's new Iowa polling, for example. Uh, you can look at this glass full or glass empty. But yesterday, the Des Moines Register had a new poll. Thirty five percent of Iowa Trump voters say January 6th capital invasion was a constitutionally protected political protest. OK, that glass is broken. 35% of Iowa Trump voters. Yes. 
Oh, wow. Okay, okay. that's not... A... So that's, a, that's only a third yeah, of, a third. what, 55% or whatever yeah. it was. Uh, very similar to 39% of GOP voters in an AEI poll who said violent action may be necessary. <laughs> Again, it's 40% of GOP voters yeah, okay. that's, who that's themselves are only about 30% of the population. Right. I mean, it's enough These are to small cause numbers, problems, and they get uh, outsized coverage because you win or you lose is really what people care about. And in fact, uh, to a large extent, actually does matter. Yeah. But, but uh, you know, uh, break the numbers down. Uh, more than a third of Republicans view the events of January 6th as a protected political protest. Well, for Democrats, all right, 93% thought it was an insurrection. For Republicans, 20% thought it was an insurrection for independents 50 percent thought it was an insurrection mm -hmm. uh those aren't those winning are numbers things. on that issue for republicans they may wind up winning anyway because you know the team is the team and so all that sort of stuff yeah. but it's not overwhelming support for the concept despite how it might feel mm. at the moment Okay, here's another one. Half of Iowans believe that the events of January 6th were an insurrection and a threat to democracy. When I say half, I mean exactly 50 percent. Uh -huh. Right. Okay. 22 percent thought it was an unfortunate event. But in the past, oh, you. you don't Jeez. need to worry about it. Oh. So you could argue 70 percent, you know, of the of the Iowa public who's going to vote Republican mm -hmm. in the end uh, thought it wasn't good. Well, that's good. Only only 18% the of the uh, total population there thought it was a political protest protected under the First Amendment. All right. Right. So it's a relatively it's small number of people who think that, even though, uh, you know, they're very loud and they carry guns. Yes. And that's what makes them so attractive, I guess, to uh, to newspaper interviewers. That and the fact that they hang around diners. I don't know what that does, but it seems to work. Yeah, they do get outside influence, uh, but we've been through this already. And I feel like you know they didn't learn anything from the, the Tea Party getting all of this attention either. But I don't know. I mean, I guess it sells copy, I suppose. And that's bad news. I mean, I can't restructure the newspaper industry fast enough. But yeah, I guess that's all that there is to explain it. And uh, well, we're, we know this much. There's no more time to explain it, unless, of course, you want to abandon the rest of your day and try to explain it. But I think probably not. So Wednesday, perhaps? Will that work for you? Uh, I'll see you on Wednesday. Okay, we'll do it that way. Thanks. Well, guess what? Welcome back now to the Figure <laughs> in the Morning show here on Netroots Radio. We had a long talk. It went. Uh, we forgot that it was only one minute, and Greg and I had plenty more to say to one another, so he filled me in on a bunch of fun stuff. And uh, I don't know whether any of that uh, came across in the last or when we rejoined, but uh, he did bring interesting information, which not surprising to me so far, uh, that uh, it, we haven't even inaugurated uh, governor-elect Glenn Youngkin here in Virginia, but already Republicans apparently registering discontent with him because he is not apparently Trumpy enough. And uh, that was always the question with him, was whether he was going to be uh, as Trumpy as Democrats feared he might be, or as Trumpy as some Republicans hoped he might be. And uh, I, I, I guess it's fairly predictable at this point, without his having been able to do anything, because he's not governor yet, that we wouldn't be able to nail it down. But that Trump supporters, obviously, I mean, I think it's to their advantage to just protest and yell and tell pollsters that they're upset with him because he's not Trumpy enough because why not say that? And then he'll read it and say, well, when I actually do begin on the job, I'll have to be Trumpier in order to satisfy them. On the other hand, the dynamics of the uh, Virginia governor's office and uh, the ability to run for office here uh, might change things a little bit in that uh, you'll recall you can't serve consecutive terms back to back as governor you're limited to one term and then out and then you can run again as terry mcauliffe did later on after an intervening term of office for someone else but uh ordinarily you'd think that the dynamic would be youngkin reads the polls and says well i better get trumpier in order to maintain their support so that when i run for re-election 
I don't alienate them. But since he's not running for re-election, uh, if, if, you know, if, if in his heart of hearts he is, in fact, not that Trumpy after all, then uh, that might be an opportunity for him to say, well, uh, I don't actually care about that because I have no plans for running for re-election. On the other hand, what do Republican governors or uh, governors of Virginia do after retiring from the governor's office after one term? Very frequently they run for the Senate. Of course, uh, now we've had a, a fairly stable and lengthy representation in the Senate by a couple of former governors who are Democrats and who are kind of stuck in place. So uh, governors uh, since then have had to find some other niche. Uh, not that you won't find Youngkin trying to fight his way into statewide office anyway, but, you know, Democratic challengers certainly are mostly frozen in place. So, yeah, like the real question here is what does Ralph Northam do after this? And uh, open question. We'll find out. But, yeah, we'll see whether how this affects Yunkin. And uh, I guess we'll get some sense of what his true colors are at some point. In the meantime, if he's not Trumpy enough, we know at least that uh, Winsome Sears is going to step in and be Trumpy enough. I guess she spent some time on the Sunday shows over the weekend and, uh, you know, put on her best Trumpy performance in order to convince everybody that there would be a Trumpy enough person somewhere in Richmond to keep people in line. I don't know. She gave some responses to, I don't know what, what did they, they must've asked her about, I guess about CRT. I don't think I saved this thing just because I, I didn't really think I was going to spend any time on it, but maybe I could search something up on it from Twitter. Cause I saw a lot of people discussing her appearance and these answers that she gave to the questions as posed and it was like word salad as usual and I it it was just I mean it's not a coherent answer but it was very clearly an attempt to play to a certain crowd and I guess that's the Trumpy crowd that you might think that uh, that Yunkin would be playing to let's see where did I where would I find this I guess if I look around Maybe just look for her name on Twitter. People will be uh, circulating that clip. All right, here it is. Uh, and here's the one I saw it with, too. Who's circulating this? Ah, media reporter from the Daily Beast, Justin Barragona, uh, whose name I may or may not be pronouncing correctly, uh, setting up this clip with Lieutenant Governor-elect Winsome Sears. Um, it, I don't know. Maybe we should play it. It's... Well, it's quite a lengthy clip, um, but you'll, you, I'll, I'll give it to you to play for yourself. It's just um, there, there's about five places where it kind of goes off the rails and there's no sense of what she's trying to get across uh, being coherent. Uh, although I guess the problem here, too, is that uh, there's not much challenge, not much pushback from the interviewer either. And is this, I don't know, I can't write, I don't know any of the CNN reporters. Um, but at any rate, uh, is it, I don't know, is that uh, Dana Bash? Yeah, I think so. Uh, so, you know, I mean, maybe she wasn't going to be pushing back on her at all. Anyway, all right, I'm going to set it up this way. We'll pocket this thing. Maybe if we don't play it all in one long, uh, one long uh, run, we won't get in too much trouble here, but uh, let me go in and I mean, there's like five different places to stop this thing and say, what? What did that even mean? And you wish that you could do that during the interview. I know they're on the air and they like to let things flow and television has a weird pacing to it. And uh, it's perhaps difficult to manage, especially when they're not really in the same studio with one another. Television tends to fool us about that. I mean, it, it's pretty obvious if you look at the at the image, they're in front of different backgrounds, but not everybody knows what that what that's like. Uh, and I don't have a great deal of experience with it, but I've been on once or twice in situations like this. And uh, when you see that kind of split screen, that means they're in different studios. And it's not always the case that you can see one another. 
We see the both of them, obviously. But what usually happens in those sorts of interviews is it's you sitting in a room alone with a camera on you. Sometimes there's not even somebody behind the camera. You know, it's just a camera and some lights in your face and something in your ear uh, of varying qualities telling you or giving you the uh, <clears throat> the audio from your interviewer. So you have no sense of what's going on there or what they look like when they're saying it or whether they're, you know, making a face or some sort of uh, indication that the rest of the viewership is getting about whether or not they believe you or whatever. And it's very difficult, you know, without being face to face to know where you can intervene and stop somebody and ask them for clarification. It's not an easy thing to to pull off. Anyway, let's run this is two minutes and 17 seconds of this gobbledygook and we'll see what we can parse out of it for you. Former vice president of the Virginia Board of Education. So explain here. how you think race should be taught in Virginia public schools. OK, so uh, important question for those of you who haven't. Uh, been paying attention to, you know, I, mean, I don't know why you would necessarily, the lieutenant governor's race in Virginia. Winsome Sears is a black woman, and it's important in this context because, of course, she's asking her, you know, as a Republican and a black woman, or as a Republican swept into office on the premise that critical race theory, whatever you might think it is, and, you know, she'll give a bad answer as to... Uh, not what she thinks it is, but why she thinks it's bad, which is to say lots of people say it's bad, and so therefore we can't have it. Um, but anyway, uh, the question is, all right, if you're not going to teach, you know, the darker side of history here and uh, give everybody a full picture of what uh, race what what role race played in, in not only in slavery but after the Civil War in uh, well in in depriving black people of their civil rights and uh, making life generally harder even when it's not directly on point in civil rights you know the things that are that, that grow out of that and make life hard for and difficult for people based on race uh, what do you think what ought we be to be doing to teach the truth here so you know good question and bad answer coming up well let me back up i beg to differ that crt is not taught i didn't fact, say that i just said it's not in the proof. curriculum just okay so right off the bat you see that there's a problem here right so crt is not taught in the uh you know in in, in public schools. We've been over that. And then that's a point that Republicans blow right past. She says, I just disagree that it's not taught. And Dan Abash, I guess, trying to cover herself. Well, I, I just said it's not in the curriculum. So, of course, what's she going to say? She's going to say it is in the curriculum. It's not. But how is she going to get away with saying it's in the curriculum? Let's let's roll it back here. and run, run it Not again. taught. I didn't say that. I just said we it's not in the proof. curriculum, just to be clear. It, it, no, 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 no. It is part of the curriculum. It's weaved in and out of the curriculum. In fact, in 2015, former governor, uh, who was just defeated, McAuliffe, his state board of education had information on how to teach it. So it's weaved in. So, you know, it's semantics, but it's weaved yeah. in. All right. So stopping right there, you see what she's done here is, of course, she's brought up the example of the uh, training for teachers, right? that there was in 2015 where they said uh, the words critical race theory were in fact used on slides that they used for teacher training, not as curriculum for kids in school, saying critical race theory might help, uh, you know, uh, give some context to why we think there needs to be a more balanced approach to the teaching of history and why there needs to be an efforts at inclusion and why there need to be efforts at bringing minority students along, uh, not, not just in the teaching of history, but in teaching of everything else and making sure that they get equality in the opportunities to absorb the education that we're offering to everybody. And sometimes that might mean necessity for special attention or different approaches that allow for uh, culturally dissimilar kids from culturally dissimilar backgrounds to come to the same understanding despite their differences. All of this being teacher training. So what does she say? Well, no, no, it's it was part of the curriculum. It was woven in and it's semantics, but it was woven in, meaning 
we told teachers that critical race theory, which they would understand perhaps as adults and professionals, uh, might help inform the way you teach the non-CRT curriculum to students. So she says it's woven in and it's just semantics. You say, the semantics are this, you say you're not teaching CRT to the kids. We say you are not teaching CRT to the kids, but we would like people to think that you are. So you see, it's just a semantic difference between the two of us. Well, they mean, of course, you're teaching the teachers to think that CRT is somehow valuable in coming to understand a curriculum and that they should then impart the curriculum based on what they understand from CRT. They should impart the non-CRT curriculum in ways that are sensitive to differences and which are more likely to be absorbed and understood by all students, <clears throat> no matter what their ethnic background. Okay, well, that's just a semantic difference to them. It, what you should do is tell teachers, please do not understand the material we are asking you to teach. Uh, please uh, go into it clueless or what? I, mean, I don't know what they're asking for, but there's an interesting thing to say. Well, it's woven in there. That is to say, somebody said CRT to somebody else, and that somebody works at a school, so it's woven in. That's really all there is to it. I'll continue with the rest of this. What we want to say, and what Governor-elect Youngkin has said, is that all of history must be taught. The good, the bad, and the ugly, because what we learn from history, okay, Dana, so is that we don't learn from history, and we continue to repeat the same mistakes. But all right, so so far that was like that that's like a throwaway platitude. Right. Uh that's the way to make the transition. There's the pivot. Well, what we're saying is we need to teach all of history, the good, the bad, and the ugly, because what we've learned from history is that we don't learn from history. <laughs> Why? That's so true. <laughs> uh everyone believes that and uh, something something and it has nothing to do with the answer you gave before about things being woven in, but okay, so now it's a transition to what? Let's find out. While we're talking about history, how about we talk about how people from the 1890s, uh, black people from the 1890s to about 1950, 1960, according to the U.S. Census, had been marrying in a percentage that had far surpassed anything that whites had ever done. All right, I got to stop it there because I didn't see anybody commenting on this. They comment on what comes next, which is quite amazing, uh, about the Tulsa riots and the Tulsa massacre and uh before we get to that no one was no one stopped and asked what the hell did you just say if i just heard that correctly she's saying all right first of all she's going to what about crt somehow like okay one i thought we pivoted away from crt but two we got to do some what aboutism on this uh sure you all say critical race theory something 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 but what about this from 1890 to 1960, and remember, I mean, that's a broad swath of, of time. But she says, why don't we talk about how from the 1890s to 1860s, I don't know if she's making a mistake here. She says the wrong word. Does she say, why don't we talk about how black people are marrying at a greater rate than white people ever did? What? What? That is, I, I'm pretty sure she just said that. Now, I don't know what relevance that would have to anything. But, I mean, let's say that's, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know what to tell you. I can't even say, uh, let's just say it's important. I mean, it isn't. <laughs> so, I don't know. I mean, is that that they're establishing families and is she trying to say that now they don't marry as much and that's bad because that's a that's a republican theme that they sometimes bring up that uh black families are somehow less you know stable than white families even though god will they god knows that white families are a mess everywhere everybody's families are a mess it's not I don't know. I, I imagine that she might have had that in her in mind at some point, maybe. Um, but that somehow, I guess maybe there the point would be, well, once there was a civil rights movement, they stopped doing that. And so they destabilized themselves. If you're the kind of person that starts with the understanding that they're less than stable to begin with. Or, I mean, it just feels like one of those things that, a, that I don't know, that might... <laughs> Maybe only a black conservative is comfortable saying, but 
I don't know. It doesn't stand to reason at any level, but I, I mean, I guess if you're the kind of person who believes that the, that black families are either, I guess she wouldn't believe they're inherently unstable because from 1890 to 1960, she believes they were very stable, but that they are unstable now. I mean, it wouldn't be out of keeping for conservative doctrine. I mean, ultra conservative doctrine that somehow uh, welfare, the welfare state that, that grew up around the, you know, great society programs, for instance, is what did it. They were, everything was great up until 1960. <laughs> for black people. And then thereafter, it all collapsed because we, you know, gradually uh, told the police to stop squirting them with fire hoses, blasting them with fire hoses and shooting them. And they haven't gotten around to the shooting part, but uh, the fire hose thing has fallen out of favor. All right. So fine. I don't know. I'm not certain what she was trying to say there, but that they were marrying. Then she gets around to this other point, which is what everybody focused on, but was equally loopy, I think, uh, about Tulsa. When we talk about the Tulsa race riots, let's ask ourselves, how did the black people amass so much wealth right after the Civil War so that it could even be destroyed? How do they do that? Uh, here, too, I don't know whether there's some hidden point that she didn't express and get around to in the short space of two minutes to make it relevant to people. But a lot of the reaction, because it was, you know, just a brief, uh, uh, almost throwaway line in this, it, it, I can't tell whether there's a larger point that's been disguised or whether it's just another pivot, like another thing to say to distance yourself somehow from CRT, like, okay, and what does she say? That uh, we're talking about the Tulsa race riots. Let's ask ourselves, how did the black people match so much wealth right after the Civil War? Well, it was 1920, so it was a little ways since the Civil War, 50-something years uh, uh, between you know, 50 plus years between us. So, uh, you know, that's plenty of time to, I guess, quote unquote, amass so much wealth. But what kind of question is that either? I, I'm not certain what that's supposed to mean. Like, well, were they asking for it because they were too successful or wealthy in Tulsa? And so no wonder there was a riot, a riot, a massacre. Or is it, I mean, I think what she's, that can't really be it, right? You, you wouldn't think so. I think I think where she's trying to go is to say, all right, well, so during this period from 1865 through 1920 or so, there were conditions such that black uh, businesses and uh, merchants were able to become you know, relatively successful. They, you know, they had to confine things to the black community largely. And that was a large part perhaps of, of what uh, led to their success. But uh, I mean, it wasn't like they were taking over as the wealthy class in America. They, you know, there were some white Americans doing pretty well, you know, in the laissez-faire period and had amassed considerably more wealth than, you know, uh, the, than, than even the black Wall Street folks had been able to amass. I mean, I, I would think an order of magnitude or two or three more than that. But what, it just seems like a weird setup of the question. But I think she's trying to say there was a period during which there were, in her view, whether it's borne out historically or not, uh, stable black families and considerable economic success. And couldn't we get back to that, even though it was also under Jim Crow and they lived in, uh, you know, black people were relegated to their own sections of town or even towns themselves. As they were forbidden to, from being in white areas after sunset. Uh, I don't know that was really the, you know, the ideal situation. It, was there black prosperity? I guess there was some, maybe even considerable. Was there black familial stability? I don't know. I guess so. If we take our word for it, uh, we could say yes to that. I don't know whether that's actually the case or not. 
But what does any of this have to do, by the way, with teaching CRT or not teaching CRT or having it be part of the teacher training curriculum but not the, the actual student curriculum? I asked you, how should black history be taught? And you said, in Tulsa, how did they get so much money anyway? It actually makes it sound like a, there was some like you were rooting for some sort of communist uh, revolution there. How'd they get to be so wealthy? No wonder the poor whites of the area came in to trash the place and kill everybody and steal that wealth. Uh, I don't think that was the message you meant to impart. I, and even guessing, giving it my best guess about what you were trying to do from a pro, you know, conservative viewpoint, it doesn't make any sense. Like, should we be... Should we teach that, that they did very well? I mean, I think so. I would actually agree that we probably should be teaching that. And then, But then you should be teaching, where did that go? And I guess that's the, the difference here. It's like Winsome Sears says, the reason that success and stability went away is welfare, the welfare state. Whereas... I say the reason that at least Tulsa went away is white people came and killed everybody and said no success for you. And teaching my version of it, which, you know, is backed by the evidence of bunches of dead people and guns all being present and it being the 1920s, not the Great Society 1960s. I mean, it's hard to argue that the Great Society program of the 1960s erased Tulsa's uh, 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 wealthy black neighborhoods because they were already gone for 40 years when the Great Society programs rolled around. The Great Society programs were in large part designed to reverse the damage that had been done from those massacres and from civil rights unrest later on where cities were in ruins because either white people had burned them down 40 years prior or unfortunately, uh, well, I guess not not quite at this stage, but urban neglect that had uh, left core inner cities to, to rot, essentially. And then later on, I guess at some uh, later date, we found, of course, uh, riots following the assassination of Martin Luther King and just general upheaval and unrest that left uh, when 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 those riots went off and left the inner city burned, that too was left to languish and nothing done to repair and refurbish there either. But that can't have anything to do with what happened in Tulsa because that was much, much earlier. It just seems like a very weird pivot and I'm not certain where it's supposed to be going. What do you think should be taught in schools? I think we should teach... Uh, well, first of all, before I answer that, let me ask, how did black people get a bunch of money? I don't know. Do you want us to teach that? Is that what you're saying? I'm not sure. But what I do know is, uh, they were marrying a lot and we don't teach that. Oh, would, would you like us to teach that? Eh, I don't actually say that either. I'm not really certain what I would want you to teach. And that's the upshot of this two minutes, the 20 minutes that we're doing about these two minutes. You know, they were coming from nothing, from zero. Some of them never even got the 40 acres and a mule. Uh, that was an interesting reference, too. Uh, none of them got the 40 acres and a mule. There wasn't any. But, okay, uh, slight oversight or maybe a bad choice of words there. Uh, but, okay. Uh, now, this is now not making sense. Dana... Dana Bash starting to look like this is going on for too long and I'm uncomfortable. This is not going anywhere and appearing to think about maybe intervening. But Winsome Sears has got the microphone, so she keeps going. So we have to pivot again. We pivoted away from CRT, but then we didn't pivot to anything. But now we got to pivot to something. Um, but I've pivoted away from where I wanted to be or what the answer was supposed to be. I got to pivot again. So we just talked about uh, black people rising up from nothing to become wealthy and successful in Tulsa in 50 something years since the end of the Civil War. Now I need to relate that to myself. What am I doing here? I didn't live in Tulsa. I wasn't uh, a slave or the, the child or grandchild of slaves. I need to tell some personal story here that connects me to this. And so 
Let's try to emulate that. The one thing that the slaves wanted, uh, well, three top things, their freedom, certainly. Then the next oh, thing yeah, was certainly. they wanted to uh, find their families. And the third thing was they wanted an education. And my God, when did education become a bad word among black people? No I don't know. Did it? I'm not certain that it did. I, it was just a weird thing. Now... All right. Well, it was interesting, too. So she's speaking for the slaves, too. Right. OK. The three things that slaves wanted. Yeah. Well, one to live Two, Yeah. Oh, okay, also sure. Yeah. Their freedom, uh, whatever. And uh, but they wanted to find their families. OK. I said three things. And so I've used two things on really basic stuff. So the third thing, I guess, education. Yes, that's that might arguably could be a, a, a thing that slaves wanted among the top three things, I suppose. And so she asks, when did education become a bad word among black people? Did it? I don't understand that it did. You started the segment talking about education, about how we shouldn't educate people about what happened to minorities in this country. When did it become a bad word? I don't know. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, the same guy who was just talking to you a second ago. Our Patreon subscription drive is still going strong with over 175 monthly donors who help keep us on the air. If we've helped keep you going during the pandemic, why not return the favor and help us keep going so we can all be together for the next disaster? Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it easy to make secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. Maybe you'd like to thank us for keeping you sane during the Trump era. Maybe you're looking forward to in-depth explanations of what's going on in the Biden administration. Whatever it is that keeps you listening, we need your help to keep bringing it to you. And hey, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running with those options too. Thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We literally could not do this without you. All right, welcome back now to the Cake Growing the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. I'm beginning to feel like we may have spent too much time on this already, but uh, we're almost at the end here. I just I have found the word salad somewhat distracting, to say the least. So uh, where were we? Yes. When did education become a bad word among black people? I don't know that it ever did, but uh, I think what she's trying to pivot back to here is uh, when did education become bad? And the answer is CRT is when it became bad, although... They would also argue uh, it became bad a lot earlier than that uh, when uh, they took God out of the schools or whatever. They can equally they're equally comfortable making that argument. Anyway, this makes no sense. And I think she even tries another like personal story pivot here in the next like 10 seconds. Let me, there's, and there's only uh, the 30, you know, just under 30 seconds of this left. So we are going to have a good education system. It's going to it's going to represent all people. And I'm going to help see that through because education lifted my father out of poverty when he came to America with only a dollar seventy five. Education lifted me because I have to find my own way in this world and education will lift all of us. OK, so super good anecdote there, by the way. Her father came to this country with a dollar seventy five. Somehow he counted the change. I don't know. Whatever. You take what you can get. Family stories, you know, propagate that way. That's fine. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, uh, education is we're going to have a good education system. That's good to know. You're not going to be able to fit that into a two minute segment, of course, but very Trumpy. You know, in terms of uh, how you present stuff like that. So you're given two minutes to explain how you're going to make education better. And you tell a bunch of other stories and then you say, well, we're going to have a good education. We're going to make great deals. Uh, we're going to have the best, most beautiful healthcare system like you can't believe. It's so easy. It's so easy. We're just going to do it. And it's going to be so beautiful you won't even believe it. So very similar. You know, I don't know how anybody pitches their education plan in two minutes but that, it took two minutes to get around to just saying we're going to have a good education system and whatever blah 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 and uh, now what does she do with the last couple of seconds nothing i think right it's dana bash trying to intervene again i want to talk about keeping on schools but about vaccines in schools uh virginia public schools are required Okay, in fact, that's it, because they run out of time on that segment, then they pivot to schools and vaccinations. I, almost 
almost be fascinated to find out what she had to say about that. But anyway, I just wanted to give you a run through of the word salad that that was there. So she's asked. The basic question is, OK, given the controversy of CRT and leaving aside the question of whether it's taught or not, you know, I mean, leaving aside the important question of, well, this whole thing is a bunch of fake crap. So. But what should we be teaching? And what was her answer? I mean, think back on this. So what did she say to this? Is the lieutenant governor, not that she's important or anything. I mean, the governor is supposed to do all this stuff. The lieutenant governor, I guess, hangs around waiting to run for governor later. Uh, you know, there's functions that they do, whatever. But And it's important who occupies any office. But what should we be teaching? Everybody's now concerned about CRT. What? How should we teach about race? Because we asked that other woman who was the leader of the uh, you know, the, the parents movement in Loudoun County where they didn't win, as you may recall. The other interview that we played from, what was it? I don't know. From the circus. Is that right? The, the showtime thing. Anyway. Um, right. Would they ask her like, uh, why should we be, you know, what, you know, what should we do about, uh, education and something and, and why did uh, CRT become such a big issue? I'll tell you why, because don't mess with our kids, right? And then asking her questions like, okay, so if you don't want race to be, you know, an important factor in how you teach these things, like you're going to teach about slavery, obviously, and that's a big part of the Civil War lesson. You're not going to ignore slavery, right? Right. And slavery was a racial concept, right? Construct. You were a slave because you were black and black people, you know, were, were thought of as property and they were slaves and the reasons they kept them enslaved was because of their race. So how do you deal with something like that without bringing race into it? And her only answer was, I'm not an educator. I'm a parent. So I don't know. Well, I know you don't know. That's why we don't consult you about that. We consult experts about that. Now you have a vote in who does the hiring of the experts and what they're trying to get to. But the reason we don't just say, parents, tell us what to do in the classroom from start to finish is because the answer you usually get is, I don't know. So she didn't say anything. Now we have, but she's not an elected official. Now we have an elected official, you know, not yet in office, granted, needs time to develop policy, granted. But what should we be teaching? And what did she tell us? Well, for one thing, let's ask how from 1890s or so to 1960s, black people were marrying at greater rates than whites ever did. Now, is that really a true thing? And if it is really a true thing, is it a relevant thing? What should we be teaching that? Does everybody know? Does every, uh, I'll just take a quick poll. I mean, raise your hand, please. Ladies and gentlemen, please. If you don't remember being taught in school. I mean, this is a great point, right? Obviously, this is the bedrock of American civilization. Do you remember being taught about marriage rates, in, historical marriage rates, and how they broke down along racial demographic lines? I remember that, right? It's like George Washington is the first president, right? Uh, the Constitution is our founding document, and demographics in, of marriage from 1890 to 1960. Huge topic. Everybody talked about that. I mean, what is that? I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm either mishearing. It's so dumb. I doubt myself for having heard it. That's how dumb. I, she, did she say marrying? There's, is there another word that sounds like that that I'm mistaking here and missing, and that will make this whole thing make sense? What were they doing at greater rates? than white people ever did from 1890 to 1960. I played it over and over. And I can't think of anything else. So I'm baffled by that. But again, the question, what should we be teaching? Well, why don't we ask about why, you know, we don't talk enough about the marriage rates? I don't really effing know. What the F are you talking about? Well, certainly there's more, right? Well, while we're on the subject, how about Tulsa? How about Tulsa? Okay, we're going to teach about Tulsa? Yeah. All right. Suppose we do teach about Tulsa. We're going to ask our our version of the history of the Tulsa race riot, as it's put here, is how did those black people get so much money anyway? <laughs> Which makes it sound like, I mean, if 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 this was a white 
man, I would say, oh my God, I think he's saying that they had it coming to him because they got too rich. But that can't, she's a black woman. She can't be saying that, right? And, you know, lots of black people will say, oh, believe me, there's plenty of black people who can say absolutely that, that thing. And they have a million different reasons perhaps for why they would do it. But they do say it. There are people who will say, okay, I'm seeing it. Maybe I'm seeing it right in front of me. But let's give her the benefit of the doubt just for the hell of it for the moment. That's not what she's saying. She's trying to say, how did they succeed? Why is it that, I mean, at the at best, you could distill this out of it, right? Why is it that black people in many cases have so much trouble succeeding now when they start with so many disadvantages and, I, you know, I'm guessing that she would then argue if we were giving her a chance to clarify her statements and trying to pry something, parse something from it and pull the teeth as necessary to get what needs to be said, said here. Is she saying, well, sure, lots of black people have terrible disadvantages today, but uh, they can't be worse than the disadvantage of coming out of slavery and yet succeeding after a fashion anyway. And I would have to agree, okay, the conditions of slavery are, in fact, much worse, for lack of a better word, than the conditions of poverty or disadvantage may be in the modern era. So how can it be that uh, blah, 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 something, something, they succeeded, whereas today's black communities are not succeeding? Well, uh I guess I would dispute whether or not that was the case. Like, what are we comparing here? Tulsa, Oklahoma, appears to have done fairly well. There are some people there that did very well. There were also black sharecroppers living in abject poverty or black city dwellers living in abject poverty elsewhere, not in Tulsa or, or in Tulsa. There were plenty of poor black people in Tulsa too, but also some people who succeeded. Today, I mean, what are we supposed to look at today? Well, you know, nobody's succeeding. No, there's still a considerable number of black people who are succeeding despite all the odds, whatever, and it's just some are, some aren't. I think you'll probably find it's relatively comparable. But, you know, again, also, you should probably keep in mind, okay, well, there was a successful black uh, business district in Tulsa. Yes, and... They could not carry their wealth anywhere and or do anything with it other than reinvest. I mean, they were tr essentially trapped in having to reinvest in Tulsa. You know, black capital wasn't movable the way white capital was at the time. And you couldn't hop in your car and drive over to the next state and say, we're going to replicate what we did in Tulsa over here. We're just going to buy this section of town. I mean really didn't work like that. It wasn't so effing great for Tulsa either. Inside Tulsa, they were doing great. They were doing okay for themselves. That's absolutely true. A lot of that was probably driven by the fact that they weren't able to carry their capital elsewhere. It had to stay in the community. And uh, I don't know if that really counts as such a great thing. On top of which, they said, eh, to hell with this. Why should you have all this success anyway? Let's kill the bunch of you. That was not very long-lived, I would say. But, you know, all right. So, again, I'm parsing all the things she's saying. And remember, just keeping in mind, the question is, what should we teach? And her answer is that we should teach that maybe all the people in Tulsa got too much money. Maybe they were too uppity. I don't know. Maybe that's what we're trying to get at here. And uh, we should be teaching that. I don't think that she actually meant that. But I guess she's saying what she wants is to say, instead of having a history lesson about what happened in history, because that's bad and it will entail telling people that black people who managed to find a modicum of success were killed wholesale by, oh, I don't know, people who were lighter skinned than they were, people that we sometimes refer to as white people now. Uh, but you're stuck with that because that's it. The history doesn't really allow much additional examination beyond that. And we you know, get into the reasons and the motivations and things. What she wants to teach is a social studies type class of, I don't know what exactly you would call it, but Instead of teaching the history of what happened in Tulsa, why don't we ask the question of 
why aren't black people able to succeed today the way they did in the 1920s pre-massacre in Tulsa? And the answer, unfortunately, is they are, and and there's much more opportunity for them to do so now, and they succeed in about the same proportion or greater than they ever did in Tulsa, but they also suffer in some sectors from poverty the way they did similarly during the Tulsa era. And what are you talking about? And by the way, none of this is history. This is, you know, sociology, but it's not history. What are we supposed to do about that? You know, I, I don't know. So there's no answer in the whole thing. So we parsed it a million ways and we extended her segment to 10, 15 times the amount of time she had to do this and couldn't, you know, but she could express none of it. And I don't know, I guess that's kind of worrisome. But what are you going to do? We would beat up the same, I'm sure, on Glenn Youngkin if he gave a two minute interview about nothing too. just uh, he as far as I know, he hasn't been giving any of these interviews at all, or at least hasn't stuck his foot in his mouth quite as badly as this one here. So uh, this example here. So, all right. I don't know. Time to stop beating up on her about it. Who knows? Maybe she'll surprise us with something fun and interesting later on. There are other things that we ought to have been paying attention to, but that was a very weird one and a little disturbing. And uh, I did wonder about that. Um, I did also see over the weekend, I guess, why not just stick with the things that I, these esoteric weird things that I saw over the weekend. That way we can save all these other fun things for uh, later in the week. But... Uh, I saw an uh, interesting story from the Sunday Times of London, which is all paywalled, of course. Um, but I saw an interesting article being discussed. Uh, they were tweeting it out this way. Exclusive, thousands of ethnic minority patients who died from COVID-19 might have survived were it not for racial bias in medical equipment. And I hear now the voice of uh, Winsome Sears or others perhaps saying, oh, great, now uh, we're going to claim that medical equipment, tubes and dials and knobs and and vials and needles and such <clears throat> is uh, not woke enough, not uh, got enough critical race theory in order to actually save the lives of black people because something, something reasons, except, you know, it's a legit thing. And they go ahead and they explain how that is in the article, which I can't read, but I can read the tweets that excerpt it. They did a good job of getting around their own firewall, sharing this information with us. But uh, anyway, this initial tweet saying, yeah, thousands of ethnic minority patients who died from COVID-19 might have survived were it not for racial bias in medical equipment. Now the U.S. and U.K. plan to overhaul international medical standards and test equipment on all races. We've heard stories like this in the in the past and uh, medical equipment but also other sorts of equipment that basically for instance i don't know the story i remember that stuck with me was the touchless soap dispensers that became briefly extremely popular and necessary for instance in the beginning days of the pandemic when we weren't sure about touching surfaces but uh i saw stories uh, about how the sensors on these machines are basically geared to respond to the uh you know the presence under their their you know the eye beam whatever the hell you would call the thing of white skin white hands reaching out and triggering the soap dispenser but that the darker your skin was the less likely the sensor was to recognize that there were hands in front of it and and so you found that black people had real difficulty getting it. It's not, I don't know whether it was with all machines or what, but that was just one simple example. And I could see where medical equipment could similarly react differently or poorly or, or sub, in some substandard way to the presence of or scanning black skin versus white skin. And you really shouldn't be able to bring your product to market unless you know it can do the function that it's designed for no matter what the skin color is and so the US and UK working together at some official level to try to revamp international marketing international standards such that you can't market these these uh medical equipment this medical material 
until that problem is addressed. So fascinating all in its own right. And there's a couple more tweets about it. Analysis of data from Public Health England showed that deaths from COVID-19 among people from minority ethnic groups were two to four times greater than those among the white population in England. And there could be lots of reasons for that. But the one they're focusing on is this. Uh, in response to this, the health secretary in the UK, Sajid Javid, I'm guessing at the pronunciation of the last name, is working with his U.S. counterpart, the one we know, Javier Becerra, to introduce new international medical standards. It will ensure medical devices have been tested on all races before they are allowed to be sold. Seems like a pretty good one. There are, uh, there's one example here given the uh, oximeters that monitor oxygen levels in the blood and were at least early on, uh, and I guess still now, we used to see it when they were trying to detect illness in people in some f way without conducting an actual COVID test on us. Uh, a couple of places I went would take your temperature and then they would take your your blood oxygen level, one or two places I went to. Anyway, the monitors uh, used for this and are used to assess whether COVID patients need life-saving treatment, oxygen therapy. Apparently, less accurate on people with darker skin. These are the things like the little things that they put over your finger to take your blood oxygen level. At the height of the COVID peak last winter, black, Asian, and other minority ethnic groups made up 28% of critical care admissions in England, writes Sajid Javid. Uh, the issue of bias with, it, with medical devices has been ducked for far too long. The possibility that a bias, even in an inadvertent one, could lead to a poorer health outcome is totally unacceptable. We urgently need to know more about the bias in these devices and what impact it's having on the front line. All I think agreeable, right? The review will look at all medical devices and other important biases like gender bias. For example, how can we ensure life-saving technologies like MRI scanners can be made accessible to pregnant or breastfeeding women? Uh, all very interesting and a good question, I thought, and I think, uh, you know, a, f a fair one. Uh, but it occurred to me now in light of this backlash against CRT and just simply declaring everything you don't like to be CRT in one form or another, I have to ask, you know, is this an okay question to ask? Why, whether it was possible that thousands of additional patients of color died needlessly because the medical equipment simply doesn't scan them the same way because of their skin color? Can I ask this question or is this, too woke can i is this too woke of a question uh are you gonna shoot people who ask this question are you gonna pick at the homes of doctors now who ask these questions because you want the freedom to say that they can't speak because it makes you feel uncomfortable as a white person are we there at that point whose permission do we need at this point in order to approach this possibly woke issue? I ask because a lot of the pundits, of course, pushing back. The Democrats have to distance themselves from this woke stuff. So who do I ask for permission to study whether or not a pulse oximeter is accurately reading the blood oxygen level uh, through black skin or not? Do I, is James Carville the guy who tells me whether that's too woke a question? Is Kyle Rittenhouse the guy who tells me whether that's too woke a question? Do we just wait for mobs and see whether or not they show up outside of Javier Becerra's home or Sajid Javid's home and start you know, protesting? Of course, he's in the UK. Maybe they don't have the same problem exactly the way we have it. But uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little worried that this could become, you know, people will just assign this, the CRT. I don't like this either. This, this makes me mad and I don't want to have this investigated, but I don't know. It's also a very esoteric and weird question. And I'm not certain that the mobs care enough about it. Uh, but I guess if they are turned on to it as something, you know, if the right, right wing, the, if the correct combination of right wing hucksters start saying it is and look they even have crt in medicine now we got to do something about this they're going to end up picketing the the homes of people who are saying i don't understand if we just if we tweak this thing can we make it so that black people can have their 
oxygen levels read correctly? Is that bad? Can I not ask that question? We're, we're in a weird spot here. I got an interesting answer to that tweet uh, over the weekend, by the way, from Stephen Jay, who says uh, it ought to be up to a faculty vote of the University of Austin. I think that probably sums things up nicely. Ah, man, there's a lot out there. Okay, let's try one more thing. We'll throw out um, one more item. What will it be? All right, how about a Trump one? Just for fun. Uh, this one, I think, just out this morning. David Farenthold back on the trail here, along with Jonathan O'Connell and Josh Dawsey and Shayna Jacobs. A lot of people on the byline for this piece in the Washington Post. New York prosecutors set sights on new Trump target. That sounds fun and promising. Widely different valuations of the same properties. I think we all know this story at bottom. But uh, good, I'm glad they're honing in on making it a real liability for them in court. It's good that this case is moving forward as well. The Trump Organization owns an office building at 40 Wall Street in Manhattan. You may remember, I think he defrauded the 9-11 uh, um, uh, relief funds out of a couple million dollars with that property. Anyway, in 2012, when the company was listing its assets for potential lenders, it said the building was worth $527 million, which would make it among the most valuable in New York. Wow. Do we think it really stands up to that kind of scrutiny? But just a few months later, doesn't matter because they, the Trump Organization, told property tax officials that the entire 70-story building was worth less than a high-end Manhattan condo. Just $16.7 million, according to newly released city records. So, of course, when they're trying to borrow against it, they say it's worth $527 million. When they're being asked to pay taxes on it, they say it's worth only $16.7 million. Hmm, emoji, right? That was less than one-thirtieth the amount he had claimed the year before. That property, now under scrutiny from the Manhattan District Attorney and New York Attorney General, along with several others like it, for which the Trump Organization gave vastly different value estimates, according to public records and people familiar with their investigations, who spoke on the condition of anonymity to discuss ongoing inquiries. After the indictment of the Trump Organization's chief financial officer this summer for tax fraud, prosecutors now appear to be examining whether the company broke the law by providing low values to property tax officers while using high ones to garner tax breaks or impress lenders. New York Attorney General Letitia James said she is considering a lawsuit and prosecutors in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office have also convened a new grand jury which could vote on criminal charges, according to the people familiar with the investigations. Among the other properties under scrutiny, former President Donald Trump's California Golf Club for which he valued the same parcel of land at $900,000 and $25 million, depending on the intended audience, and an estate in urban New York for which Trump's valuations ranged from $56 million up to $291 million. The valuations were all given in the five years before Trump won the presidency. Prosecutors appear to have dug deeply into those properties, according to court papers and people familiar with the investigation, They've compiled reams of emails, planning documents, and financial data, even seeking the initiation fees Trump charged golf club members as far back as a decade ago. In Los Angeles, they have asked for geology reports on the rock layers under Trump's course, where the value was affected by a history of landslides. They also have sought detailed records from two outside companies that worked with the Trump Organization to formulate these valuations, appraisal firm Cushman & Wakefield, and law firm Morgan Lewis. In court filings, prosecutors have referred to emails in which they said the Trump executives or a Morgan Lewis lawyer pushed appraisers to change their findings. Neither Morgan Lewis nor Cushman and Wakefield responded to questions, of course. Real estate appraisers said it was highly unusual for any property owner to give such widely different values for the same property during the same time period. Yeah, I would think so. This is way, way beyond anything that's believable, said Norm Miller, a professor of real estate finance at the University of San Diego, who has appraised properties for 50 years. I've never seen anything like a gap that extreme, but extreme is not the same as illegal. 
Legal experts said that if prosecutors wish to prove a crime, they will need to do more than simply prove Trump's valuations were wrong. Is it an overly optimistic uh, or enthusiastic perception, said Robert Masters, a top former top aide to the district attorney in Queens. Does that make it a lie? Oh, familiar question. Masters said prosecutors would probably need to show that the figures were wrong on purpose, falsified deliberately with an intent to deceive a lender or the government. Masters said that may require a witness on the inside who could explain the decision making behind the numbers. Is there somebody there who can translate the books? He said. The Trump Organization declined to comment for the article. Of course, Trump's political office did not respond to questions. In the past, Trump has said that the New York investigations are political attack by Democrats. An investigation that is in desperate search, he says, of a crime. Well, we'll see how this thing progresses. There's much more to this article, of course. Not that we could fit it in here, but just thought I would raise your awareness of the fact that it is happening. Among other things, what you're happening and which we can cover in later episodes of the show. Now encouraging me to perhaps pre-tape for later on this week. No promises yet. But what I can promise you is, of course, the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy comes up next with Justice Putnam. And he's got his eye on things we definitely didn't get to today because we left them lingering on Winsome Sears. For instance, America's growing threat of right-wing vigilantism in his spotlight today. Then on the rest of the menu, the GOP embraces practicing medicine without a license as a substitute for vaccines. Hell, why not, right? Workers and families with private health insurance would reap big savings on prescription drugs from a little noticed, little noticed provision in Biden's social from agenda bill. Radio.com. That sounds good. You have been listening to k in the morning with David Waldman. How about this? U.S. Rhodes Scholars for 2022 include a record number of women. Internationally, the UK will probe racial bias in medical devices. I knew we were going to go somewhere with that. So more about that from Justice Next. What else? The US seeks a balanced approach as fears grow that Russia may invade Ukraine. Keep an eye on that.